Hey, good morning. Welcome back to another daily devotional. Today we are in Matthew chapter 15. Let's go ahead and get started. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation. Now remember, Jesus has just been in the garden. He's been taken and he's gone to Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas um, sentences him to death. But now he has to go to Pontius Pilate, the Roman ruler, because Caiaphas is a Jewish leader and they do not have the authority to put anyone to death. To be able to do that, they need Pontius Pilate to agree and to carry out this death. So Jesus is now going to Pontius Pilate. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes of the whole council, bound Jesus, carried him away, delivered him to Pilate. Pilate said, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said to him, Thou sayest. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate again asked, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so Pilate marveled. Now, why was Pilate concerned about his kingship? That's about the only way that he could have him killed is because they Pilate worked for Rome, and Rome did not tolerate anyone who was a king outside of Rome. No um there could be no uprisings. There could be no traitors. There could be nothing. And so he had to figure out if Jesus was attempting to set up a kingdom in lieu of Rome. Now at the feast, he released to them one prisoner, whoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay hold bound with them that made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. So, and the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. And Pilate answered them saying, what, who do you want me to release to you, the, the king of the Jews? For he knew that the priest, chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that they should rather Barabbas. See, at this time, Pilate would release one prisoner um, and let him go. That he, and he said, do you want king of the Jews or do you want Barabbas? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate answered and said to them again, what do you want me to do with him that's called the king of the Jews? And they cried out, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? And they cried out even more, crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, delivered Jesus. And when he had scourged him to be crucified. I found this, this interesting profile in leadership here. Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, stood at a crossroads. The fate of the very son of God rested in his hands. This same Jesus, who was only weeks before, had performed miracles of healing and provision, now faced a mob demanding his death. Pilate interrogated Jesus and found he had done nothing wrong of, or worthy of crucifixion. But instead of leading, instead of taking the unpopular stand and allowing this innocent man to go free, Pilate gave in to the outright outrage of an unruly crowd. He released a notorious criminal and sentenced the guiltless man to die an agonizing death on a cross. Pilate recognized the injustice, but with the mob looking on, Pilate washed his hands of Jesus's blood, literally. He, in Matthew, it says that he called for a basin of water, washed his hands, said, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. And he allowed him to be executed. In a moment of supreme paradox, God uses Pilate's refusal to lead to do and do what was right to carry out his own plan of salvation. In his providence, God saw into the heart of Pilate and knew that when push come to shove, this man would give in to the demands of the crowd. When God calls his people to lead, when he calls us to make unpopular stands, we cannot wash our hands of the responsibility. Leaders will face moments when they do not have a choice but to stand up to the crowd and do what is right. Pilate was a leader who refused to take responsibility. We, we have to take responsibility and do what is right. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called per Peritheum, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on his head with a reed and did spit on him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. Everybody's going to worship him. 
And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon of Cyrene who passed by coming out of the country, a father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. And they brought him unto the place of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. The agony, the agony in the garden now compounded with the beating during the trial, made his body so weak, so weak he could not carry his own cross. Even though his disciples forsook him, they were still those who followed him. They came to the place of the skull, the place called Golgotha, the place that purchased our salvation. And when they arrived, they offered Jesus narcotic, but he refused. Jesus would rather embrace a full cup than accept a simple cup to comfort his pain. And whenever he had crucified him, they partake his garment, casting lots on them. Every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the subscription of the accu accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on the right and one on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, thou dost destroy this temple and build us in three days. Save thyself and come, come off the cross. Likewise, also the chief priest mocked him and with the scribes, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross and let's see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. So the soldiers proceeded with the crucifixion. Three crosses were laid on the ground. Jesus was placed in the middle. He stripped naked. He's laid down on the tool of torture. His arms were stretched out and a nail the size of a railroad spike was driven into his human hands and feet. The human body became the weight of agony. The subscription on the cross, Jesus, the King of the Jews, was written in three languages, Hebrews, the the language of Israel, Greek, the language of Greece, Latin, the language of the Romans, so that anyone who passed by would know who hung on the tree. Isn't it ironic that the message is the same, but the language is different? In a way, God used Pilate to write the gospel to the whole world. Jesus had been mocked by the religious ru rulers. He had been mocked by the soldiers, and now he's being mocked by those passing by and even the thieves with him. And in the sixth hour to come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of them which stood heard it, and behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge with full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, let alone, let us see whether Elias will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Mark only records one of Jesus' last statements on the cross, but when he put all four Gospels together, we learn all, what all six were. He had six statements. The first is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second, to the thief who asked to be remembered, he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. We'll learn more about him in Luke. He said to his mother, Here is your son, and to the disciple John, Here is your mother. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Next, he says, I am thirsty. And then lastly, he said, it is finished. And we'll get into those a little bit more. And in the veil of the temple was written, entwined from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood over against him saw that he had cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There was also women looking afar off, among whose was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and the less of the uh, James and Salome, Salome, who also, when he was a, in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. So there was a couple of phenomenons here. The veil of the temple is rent from top to the bottom. The veil was a curtain that was 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, as thickness the palm of your hand. It was so thick it could withstand an earthquake from the top, meaning no man did this. It ripped from the top to the bottom. The second phenomenon was an earthquake, God's judgment on the earth. And the third phenomenon was the graves were open and bodies awoke. The death of Christ and the accompanying 
phenomenons deeply moved the centurion. The Roman officer was overcome with fear that he, he had heard what was done in the trial. He saw Jesus's response. He heard the statements. He witnessed the earthquake. And now he's convinced, truly, this was the son of God. And now when the evening come because of the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Therame, an honorable counselor, which also waited in the kingdom of God, waited for the king, came and went in boldly into Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead and called unto him the centurion. He asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew of it, the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in linen and laid him in a sepulcher, which he had hewn out of the rock and rolled the stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. So Mark records that Joseph of Therimea and John records that Nicodemus came to request the body of Jesus. Both of these men were members of the Sanhedrin, Pharisees who were come to believe in Jesus. Um, some theologians believe that Jesus requested these men to bury his body, but and had not Joseph moved the body, it would have violated scripture, Isaiah 53, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Pilate still had control of the matter, so Joseph went boldly and requested the body of Jesus, took it down, and laid it in his own tomb. So Jesus dies. They, they hang him on the cross and he dies. I know that that's a very gruesome and I feel like I didn't even do it justice, honestly, because it is such a pivotal point of everything that we believe. Everything we believe is wrapped up in that story. It's really the sacrifice. Jesus gave his life to gain our salvation. Anywhere worth going carries a price tag. Jesus chose to endure torturing, mockery, humiliation, and excruciating death, even though he could have stopped it at any moment. The leader of humanity, the last Adam, decided that gaining the world was worth the pain of the cross. Paying for your salvation, paying for my salvation was worth the pain of the cross. I'm thankful for the cross of Calvary. I'm thankful for the blood that he shed. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And I've got it plenty. And I'm very thankful that he shed his blood to forgive my sins and your sins. Why don't you sometime today just stop what you're doing and just close your eyes and simply say, Jesus, thank you for the blood you shed on Calvary. Thank you so much for forgiving my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for thinking that I was worth it. In Jesus' name, God bless you and have a great day. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.